Dear writer, you need to quit. This is the show that helps you know what to quit, what to keep, and what to question. My name is Becca Syme, and I'm a Gallup Certified Strengths Coach with thousands of hours of coaching six- and seven-figure authors, mid-listers, major award winners, and new authors alike, because everyone needs to quit something. Anyone can tell you what worked for them, and of course, they say it might not work for you but they can't tell you why. Well, I can tell you why. Welcome to the QuickCast. Hi, and welcome to episode 14 of the QuickCast. Today, we're going to be talking about what to quit in an author crisis. And we have a very special guest with us today, someone who is a crisis management specialist, She's worked in PR and marketing. She also happens to be the co-host of the Smarty Pants Book Marketing Podcast. Many of you know already who I'm talking about. So I'd like to welcome to the quick cast, Chris Syme, who also happens to be my mother. And so Chris, for those who are not familiar with your background, especially in this arena, um, talk to me for a second about your experience here. Well, crisis management is something that I've been interested in for a long time. Uh, when I went to Germany in 1999, took a team of volleyball players over as a coach. Um, I was just getting ready to go to grad school the following fall, and I had my thesis material and everything all picked out. And then when we got over there, we got in a wreck, a big one. We had kids in the hospitals in different towns. And because the organization that I worked for at the time had, had crisis insurance and all this pre-planning done, It was really a a fascinating thing to watch unfold. So I changed my track at that time, went to graduate school, um, did my graduate work in crisis management. And then after that, uh, this was kind of in the middle of my whole media relations career in marketing. Um, I worked as a crisis consultant for university athletic departments. That's where I started. I traveled around the country training staffs and student athletes (laughs) how to behave themselves on social media. But I think a lot of the reason we don't see a lot said about crisis management is because it's, it's a very specialized field and you don't want to just stand up and say, you know, oh, I had a crisis and this is how I managed it. <laughs> you want to get somebody that's an expert. It's kind of like hiring a lawyer, sort of like, so it's a specialized field, but I've seen a lot in my day. <laughs> well, One, what I've seen from the inside watching you do this job is that while I know you've worked several crises that people would be familiar with if I said their names, right? Maybe the more interesting ones are the ones where you were involved where they they weren't really known about because the people followed your advice and they handled things appropriately. And um, the so that from, from an outsider's perspective, I find that to be really fascinating because as an author, I watch both clients and students and just random authors go through these crises. And so there are those three different levels. And just so that people know, you have a book out, it's called Crisis Management for Authors. I'm gonna put a link to that book in the show notes so that people can read more about this. Uh, We also did a podcast uh, duo on the Smarty Pants Book Marketing Podcast on this where you cover the three different types. So we're not gonna get into that a lot today because of course what this podcast specializes in is what to quit. And we're gonna talk to the crisis management specialist that I know um, who's worked with major athletic departments and people whose names you would recognize. What do you think is the number one thing that authors need to quit doing when it comes to crisis management? Well, this is authors and university presidents and everybody I've ever worked with, this is the number one rule. You have to quit pretending that it won't happen to you because that precludes you from making any kind of preparation or prevention of any kind. And it's, it's, um, you have to make sure that you do little things like set up Google alerts. That's simple and free um, on your name, on your business name, and on your books. If you want to, if you have some really big ones that people are talking about, especially new ones, Um, And also make sure that you are uh, monitoring your social media. And I know I shouldn't have to say that because we're probably talking to kind of a half and half crowd. Half the people are addicted to it and the other half don't want to look at it. So, but you need to monitor it. That just means 
glance at it and make sure that there's not a red flag there you need to take care of. So don't pretend that it won't happen to you is the big deal. So don't be a bull. Well, I think that anybody and authors are public figures and you're also a business. So you got the double whammy, you know, you, you, you've got two things that can irritate people. So you have to be, you know, you, you have to be aware that it's out there. And if you're aware of how to handle it, then when it, if, if it ever should happen to you, you'll be you're okay. Ready. I always say that crisis management is the best thing that you're, hopefully never going to want to have to yeah. take care of, so. Yeah. What about number two? You said winging it. What does that mean? We need <laughs> to quit winging it. Well, the other thing, is, that means that if, let's say you go into your Facebook page and you see somebody said something nasty about you. So what's the first thing you want to do? Well, you want to respond, right? Yeah, away, you want right? to respond. That's, well, that's winging it. think it's because, a conversation. Yeah. yeah. So winging it means I'm just going to take it however I feel or whatever I see. I'm just going to respond to that. And that's, that's a no-no. You cannot do that in those kinds of situations because I always like to liken a crisis to a fire, okay? And a, and a troll or a spammer or whoever it is has a big can of gasoline and you have a big can of gasoline. And every time you respond, you pour gas on the fire. Then they pour gas on the fire. And instead of the fire dying down, it keeps getting bigger. So you just want to make sure that you understand the process of how to respond. Uh, we always use the three listen, engage, respond uh, kind of slogan, but don't just react. Yeah. And just so those of you who are listening, listen, engage, respond is in the crisis management for authors book. So if you want to know more, please read that. But we're just going to cover some things to quit today. So, all right, authors need to quit panicking. <laughs> well, you, you um, referred to the crisis levels in the book, crisis, yeah. and we're not, we don't need to go into them, but let me just say that the first two levels of crises are things that you can probably just handle yourself if you know the process. Yeah. Um, everybody thinks that, well, I mean, I just look at authors and their reactions to bad reviews. A bad review is a level one. It's like, ignore it. You know, I mean, there, there are certain things that you have to learn to um, get kind of that armadillo skin over. You can't just, yeah. you know, fall off the face of the earth every time somebody doesn't like you. I know that that might sound a little harsh, but you have to just take a deep breath, you know, keep calm and carry on, I think is, is probably a good thing. But what that allows you to do too, is it, it'll, it allows you to main, to keep the adrenaline level low because adrenaline um, has a tendency to make you do things that you normally wouldn't do unless you're in like a real fight. So you just want to keep your emotions down and remember the process, respond accordingly, and just take a deep breath. Everything's going to be okay. Yeah, we talk about this in Write Better Faster as the, whenever the adrenaline comes, the, the emotions immediately overwhelm the logic. And so no matter how logical of a person you think you are, you're going to be overwhelmed by emotions when adrenaline spikes. That's why we have adrenaline. It's literally the purpose, the biological purpose of adrenaline. Mm -hmm. So that you don't stand there thinking about whether or not this lion is a mean lion when there's a lion in front of your cave. You need to just respond by fighting or flighting, right? And so know that for me, the key of knowing that you are going to panic a little bit is recognizing that we're all prone to adrenaline and that we need to just pause. So just pause. So I love that. Right. I think that in a crisis, you need to, using your same analogy, you need to look at that animal in front of you and decide, is this a lion or is it just a big cat? Yeah. You know, I mean, they, yeah, they, we've got, we they always look the same. And <laughs> the logic, yeah. So authors in a crisis need to quit engaging. What does that mean? This is a tough one for people yeah. because um, everybody, we love our fans and we want to connect with them. We want to, we want to protect ourselves and our reputation. We want to make things right. We want to tell the truth because a lot of what happens during a crisis is just lies and you have to be able to stop and kind of stop, look, and listen, you know, like they taught us when we were little kids about crossing the street. You have to really understand what's going on. So the, what you don't want to do is you don't want to engage. 
what you want to do is that you need in you need you already have a message let's say somebody said you did something and you know that you didn't do it so rather than say well i didn't do that what you need to do in in crisis management is you put together a message that that assures everybody that that everything's okay and that that you that you're aware that this is that this is out there and I want to thank you for supporting me kind of thing. I mean, the book goes into a lot of detail about how to message, but before you ever, ever put your finger on a key on the keyboard to respond to a negative comment, you have to have a message pre thought through. And yep. in a crisis, you never veer from that. Never. Yep. You, the only time you veer from that message is if you've strategically contacted an influencer or somebody offline and you're having an offline conversation so that you can fill them in on questions that they might have or ways that they can help you or whatever it is but online in the public eye you never ever veer for message and i know that i can hear you out there saying yeah but that's really bogus it makes me look like i'm just some big stupid business just saying one thing over and over again everything's going to be okay the point is is and we'll talk about this in a moment, is that once this thing starts kicking in, you kind of have to give your statement. Crisis management is not about discussing, it's about stating. Yep. And then you kind of pull back. Wait, yep. And you don't get involved anymore for a while. Yeah. And it depends on the severity. Forget, but. I'll never forget doing a coaching call with somebody who was in the middle of a crisis. And thankfully she had contacted me before she started doing anything but this, this particular engaged thing i think is so hard for authors because our very first response often is but i didn't do what they're saying that i did and i had to tell her like that doesn't matter it doesn't matter if you didn't do that thing now is not the time to argue and i actually got that from watching chris go through a really difficult um crisis that we won't name because the you know it's it's confidential, but a really difficult crisis where the person in question was accused of something they absolutely did not do. And it, it caused a swarm when they defended themselves. And because I watched that happen, and I was like, I know that this is what's going to happen if you keep engaging with this content. Their opinion is their opinion right now, and there's nothing that you can do about it except wait until their adrenaline dies down and your adrenaline dies down. And she did, and it was really difficult for her. Like it was, <laughs> I think I talked to her more in that one 24 hour period than I, than I have talked to her since then, just because it was so hard for her. But, but the key that I felt was important was she didn't engage with that initial message because somebody was really offended and they were right. Because that's the other piece is that her first instinct was to say, well, I didn't say that. But when she waited and didn't engage and she waited 24 hours and she realized, oh, yeah, I can see how they think that I said that. And then she had a totally different message 24 hours later. And it was a, it was a really fascinating thing to watch. Well, on the, on the other side of that, let's talk just briefly about how to work behind the scenes in a crisis, because I think that's really important. So I had a a big crisis <laughs> one time that was um, I kind of got roped into because it was a local crisis, but it was a national company. And by the time I came in, they had already been on NBC. They were getting ready to go on MSNBC. And I called the guy because I saw him on NBC and I said, do you have some, do you have a PR people that are helping you? Because I, I, I felt for the guy. And he like said, the company. Yeah. yeah. And, and so um, I, I walked in right away. I got hold of the, the contact at MSNBC and said, I want you to send me a list of questions and I'll okay them or not okay them and then you can talk. But what we did during that crisis, and this it was a difficult one because if you have a hot button issue, then there's a whole new set of rules. But what we needed to do was we, I was, he was getting inundated with emails of good people and bad people. The good people were asking questions. The bad people was just, you know, spewing. And uh, so what we did was we looked through those emails and we found people that were influencers and we reached out to them through email and telephone and answered their questions. 
so that they could be start the word of mouth, the organic, not go online and blab, you know, well, I know the truth, but to assure the people in their circles of influence that everything was okay and that we were taking care of it. And so there, and I worked for a university one time where we, where they contacted me before they, they knew a crisis was coming because they were going to make an announcement. And so they said, what can we do to help? And I said, well, didn't so-and-so from ESPN go to, isn't he an alumni of yours? And they said, yeah. So I said, well, let's reach out to him. And so we reached out to him before the announcement was made and he had all this talking points all ready to go. When the, when the stuff hit the fan, he, he helped us out quite a bit. So I think sometimes you can, you can reach out strategically to people because your fans are going to have questions. Your author friends are going to have questions and you may want to reassure them that everything's okay. Yeah, and I'm going to put a plug in because I know that you won't say this, but I will because I've seen it happen to several people. Please don't forget to reach out to someone who, who's a specialist in these areas if you get into a really difficult crisis. Like if you get into one, you now know who to contact. I'm just saying, contact Chris. But um, when you get into that level, I've seen the help that it can be to have a uh, objective third party helping you to make the decisions. And so I'm just gonna say, contact Chris. Anyway, so your number five thing that authors need to quit doing in the middle of a crisis is deleting emails. Interesting. Yeah, that's kind of a, a prevention when it comes to should you have a legal issue somewhere on down the road. I know sometimes when we open our emails and people are spewing hate at us, we just kind of freak out and delete everything. And if, you're, if you have an issue where somebody is sending you threatening emails, um, where there's a, maybe there's an IP, an intellectual property issue, and somebody is saying it's this way and you're doing it wrong, you need to save all those emails in a folder. Don't look at them. <laughs> don't go back and revisit them. Yeah, it's just like, them. just like yeah. bad reviews, just leave them alone. But do save them because should you ever have to go to court or file a complaint for any reason, you need to have those for evidence. You don't need to worry about social media or anything that's in the public record. Um, an interview on a radio station or a TV station, you don't need to run around and find copies of those. This is just an issue related to email. Yeah. Or and snail then, mail. Yeah, so, any, any documentation that you get for sure. So yeah. number six, that we need to quit is giving everyone a say. What does that mean? <laughs> well, again, it's just because I know authors and they're very giving. Most authors are very giving, social, you know, love their fans kind of people. And when we have a Facebook page or a Twitter account and, you know, we want to, we, we like comments. Everybody tells us, oh, the more comments, the better. You know, you got to engage. Um, everybody doesn't need a say, especially at this point in time. So you need to have a policy on all your online channels that grants you the right to delete any comment that's hateful, mean, off topic. Um, I use the about section on my Facebook business page for this. I just make it clear, it just, it's one sentence, maybe two, I can't remember, but it's just, you know, I reserve the right to delete anything that's hateful, defaming, and, and then just please behave yourself, so let's all be nice kind of thing. Your Facebook right, page is your page. Okay, number seven. Quit going it alone. What does that mean? Well, we talked about this a little bit already, when, uh, but you do need to reach out to friends and family and fellow authors, especially that you know very well that aren't going to go behind your back and blab it, you know, anything that you say. Um, and, but this, you're not going to, it's not a truth telling thing. It's just a, everything's okay. I just wanted you to know that this is happening. So if you read anything or see anything and you don't think that I saw it and you want it to bring it to my attention, just send me an email or send me a message. Um, I, and in business, we always tell people to, sh to send these out to your shareholders or your stock, you know, people who have stock in your business. And if you have, you know, those super fans out there, your advanced readers or people who are follow you real closely on social media, do not reach out to them through social media. Reach out through back channels, email, telephone. Um, let them know that, that everything's going to be all right. Probably ask them not to go to your defense in public. Um, th they should probably pull back a little bit too because they also have a gas can in knowing you. 
and if they if they engage that that they can keep it they can keep it going well and you talked a little bit too in the book about um crisis prevention right and this is one of those areas where crisis prevention can be helpful because if you're already building your core of invested people so that you know who will want to hear from you if, if a crisis ever happens um, those are the people that you want to be building right now and just building goodwill, like building positive uh, relationships and building happiness and building hope with people like so that there is the sense of goodwill when you if you should ever need to draw on it, which we hope you won't. And Chris made this point in the um, Smarty Pants book marketing podcast when we talked about it. The number of very serious crises is very small. It seems like there are a lot of them because we see them pop up a lot, but it's yeah. very unlikely that the super serious ones will ever happen to you. But in case it does, you build that goodwill with people and then you'll be prepared for when anything happens. Right. And you build it anyway, because um, people buy books from people they like, you know, yeah. we know that. Yeah. Uh, so it's, but this is, this is the idea that you want to have your, your fans know that everything's okay, but you don't want to have that discussion again on social. You want to have it on back channels. Um, you don't want to be talking about a crisis on your social media channels while it's going on. Yeah. You just want to keep all that um, discussion and conversation with friends and family and good author friends and maybe publishers, whomever, that all has to be done in back channels. And um, I, when I am doing some really intense crisis work, for big companies or big universities, I always tell their media people just to stay off social media. Just stay off. Don't even go on there. Um, you because that's what they hired me to do. So it, but it's, it's the idea that you want things to carry on as normal. You want us if you, if you're launching a book, you still want those those posts to go out, those emails to go out. But you want to dial back your public facing posting quite a bit until well, I usually tell people 24 to 48 hours and depending on the severity and, and how quickly it's dying down. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to say you, you made a comment a fire goes out without any fuel. Um, and I think that seems to be the big consistent thing is our first response is always to unknowingly throw more fuel on it without realizing what we're doing. And so to know that, it's okay. We can still, uh, we can still respond tomorrow. Well, cause we're uh -huh. sticking up for ourselves or yeah. we're sticking up for our friends. And that's another thing we didn't mention, but should probably be said quickly is that if you have a friend that's an author that's going through a crisis, don't go on their Facebook page and post, I'm with you. Yay for you. Send her an email or call her on the phone. Yeah. So. And I guess for me, that always is, there's always a real person behind all of these crises. And so the, the, danger is that no matter how justified we think we are in having an opinion or how much we like our friends, we have to think about the fact that there's a person behind every keyboard. And, um, and we don't want to be the ones who are making it worse for anyone else in addition to it being worse for us. We don't want other people to make it worse for us, but, right. um, but there's always a real person there and having empathy um, in talking with, with authors who have gone through this one of the most difficult pieces of being in the middle of a crisis for them, I think, is feeling really isolated. And so one of the things I want to say about going it alone is don't be afraid to reach out to your friends um, via private message or email or phone um, just because they're going through a crisis. That's not what this is about because they'll often feel very isolated if they're being attacked by people. And so showing empathy and being kind to them is always good. It's just not necessary to do it publicly. I think we think that because we have a mouthpiece that we have to use it all the time. And really, we need to be, you know, strategic and conscious about how we're adding to the dialogue and to make sure that, um, that we're not doing harm, I guess. And then on the last point, we're going to talk about kind of the sliding down into that is quit adding fuel to the fire. Right, right. Crises will burn themselves out because just keep that analogy in front of you that it's a fire and it's going to go out. And if you don't 
you know, throw wood on it, it'll go out. So be careful of being overactive on social media. I think sometimes we're, we're, we want to defend ourselves, we want to defend our friends, we want to talk about how wrong they've been or whatever. Um, you need to be able to pull yourself back. And this is going back to what Becca just said about enlisting friends. I think, um, you know, let them know that you're feeling really anxious. And so, you know, they, they can talk you down off of a ledge, but you want to dial back your social media a little bit. Just keep it business-like. If you, if you have messages that are already um, on auto to go out because you're launching a book or you've got a BookBub deal coming up or something, you can still continue to do that kind of stuff. Just as far as you're expressing yourself personally, you want to pull yourself back. You want to take a deep breath. You want to go take a bath with some essential oils. You know, you want to go out and take a walk. You, you just want to get, keep your mind off of that if you possibly can. Um, and, and just, you know, let it die down before you pick it back up again. And, and every once in a while in a crisis, a little fire will pop up on the side, maybe a week or two later when somebody Googles something and they say, wow, that happened and I missed it. So they're gonna try and start it back up again. We had that with the company I talked about earlier that had a national crisis. And um, so just again, be diligent in monitoring things, take a deep breath um, and just stay the course until it, it runs its course. One of the reasons I wanted to have Chris on the podcast today was to be able to talk about the why behind why it's important not to immediately engage in a crisis when you have an author crisis. And I want to say two things. This is not because we don't want you to address the issue. Um, some of the biggest crises that I see authors come into contact with these days are when someone accuses you of doing something or when someone uh, has an opinion about an action that you've taken or a book that you've written or a review or something that you've said at a conference um, or a particular way that you run your business. And so there are an awful lot of ways that you can get involved in a crisis. And some of them are more minor and some of them are very major. But the why behind why we want you to not panic and immediately get involved is not so that you can avoid addressing the situation. We always want to address the situation. We just don't want to address it in the middle of a crisis. So a crisis is like a fire that burns, and Chris talked about this, and she talked about it more in her book. But a crisis is like a fire that burns, and it's gonna consume everything quickly, almost to the point where what is being said is not necessarily even what the people in the moment are feeling. And so we're responding out of adrenaline. We're responding from a desire to defend ourselves or to prove that we didn't do something wrong or to prove that someone else did something wrong or to respond in support to a friend of ours or something like that. Um, especially when there is injustice, injustice that's been done uh, when we're trying to defend someone's honor. Those are very quick to engage and very emotional responses. We still want to address the situation. We just don't want to do it when everyone is invested in adrenaline-fueled moments, right? So we can't help that we get an adrenaline spike when we want to defend ourselves. That's just a biological thing. It happens to everyone but we still want to address the content. What happens in a crisis is that most of us who are involved in it are not thinking in our right minds in that moment because we're being spiked by adrenaline all the time. Once the adrenaline wears off and we can have a conversation with everyone who's involved, it's so much easier, especially to have empathy and to be able to acknowledge at that moment what my part was. All we can ever do, and this is the most difficult thing I think for us to get about the why, all we can ever do is acknowledge what our own part was in creating the situation. We can't control what other people do or say. We can't control what anyone who is not us, how anyone else responds. And that is a hard, Thing to come to terms with because a lot of us care about the industry and we care about our peers, we care about our friends, and we care about the future. And we want to see things happen in a way that we think is correct. 
but in the moment in a crisis is not the time to do that. Again, the very first thing I want to address about the why is that we do still want to address the concept of the crisis. We just don't want to do it in the middle of the fire. So just wait until the fire burns out and then let's engage with that. When, when everyone who's involved has had a chance to step back and look at what's happened and to think about what is the right way to proceed from here. So again, it's not to ignore things. It's not to not address when we have participated in something that was difficult or hard or um, that other people didn't like. The second thing I want to say, and this especially applies to things that are level one crises, which are things like reviews, where we're dealing primarily with someone else's opinion about something that we have done. You can never tell someone that their opinion is wrong. Their opinion is their opinion. All you can do is empathize with them and hope that you can correct the situation if possible. There is not a way, if a reader doesn't like your book, there's not a way to convince them that they will. There just isn't. And in fact, the convincing will only make it worse. And one of the things I always suggest um, with people is don't ever respond immediately if you get a review, no matter what it says. And the example that I use is something that happened to my co-writer and I, where we got accused of doing something in a book that was not something that we had intended. And that moment of, I didn't intend to say that, was the moment where we responded, right? And thankfully, both of us are very private people. And so we didn't want to get on and start discussing um, what the, the issue that the reviewer had brought up. And after we gave ourselves 24 hours to think about what had happened, we realized that if you have a certain experience, then everything that even remotely resembles that experience is going to feel like that experience. And so we were able to stand back and empathize with her and say, not to her, but to each other, um, wow, it's crazy that we didn't put that in there and yet that someone saw that that's what it was. And to be able to separate ourselves from, I didn't intend to do that, not that we defended ourselves publicly because it wasn't important. The important thing was that that reviewer spoke what she saw. And if other people who have a similar experience want to say that they're gonna believe her, then that's their decision. That's their right to do that. The, the thing that I think we miss a lot with as being authors is that not every reader is our reader and not every story is for every reader and reviews are really important for readers to be able to self-select what's for them and what isn't. And maybe not everybody believes that way because they just want their books to be sold widely and read widely by everyone. But the reality is not every story is for every reader. And that's something we need to really uh, mesh with. As, as authors so that we can allow readers to have their opinions and they can say what they need to say and every reader is right about what they saw in the book and you just can't convince them that they're not and it's not even worth it. This is why in level one when you get a negative review, um, the, what Chris does in the book is to just ignore them no matter what they say and it's, again it isn't because they're correct about your intention. It's that they are correct about their experience and you cannot convince them that they aren't. And it's really not worth trying to convince them that they aren't. Once you've let 24 hours pass beyond the initial adrenaline-fueled, fear-fueled, anxiety-fueled moment, then you can decide if you're going to respond or not. And that's totally up to you. I am 100% in favor of never, ever responding to reviews, no matter what they say. But some people are not like that, and that's okay, and they're going to make their own choices. And then know that if you bring the crisis back up again, then it has the potential of escalating. And that's the other, that's the other reason that I say the why behind not responding is that you don't ever want to escalate a crisis beyond where it needs to be. So those are a couple of the whys behind why we gave the advice that we gave today as far as what authors need to quit in a crisis. Again, it isn't because the crisis isn't worth responding to. It's all about the biological reasons why we should wait and the psychological reasons behind why we should wait and engage once the crisis is finished. And so 
I want to thank Chris for being here and for answering our questions. If you have more questions or you want to uh, discuss anything, please comment below. Um, there's always an opportunity to talk to either me or I will go and find her and have her come and respond um, if you would like to ask her questions. But please do engage with the content. We'd love to hear what your questions are. Next week, we're going to return to the KeepCast portion, and we're going to be talking about the Strengths for Writers um, theme of Maximizer and how, if you have Maximizer, how to utilize that to do your best work in your writing. And so please like and comment, please share and subscribe. If you have a moment and would like to check out the Patreon content, we have our first live Q&A for May that's going to be starting next week. And so please go over and check out the Patreon. You can do live small group coaching um, with me uh, if you are a Patreon subscriber. And so please check that out. But until next week, I hope that you have a great week writing, and I will see you on the next QuickCast.